Hello everyone, it's Battlefield historian Matt McLaughlin here, and today is D-Day, June 6th, the anniversary of the great Allied landing to take back Western Europe from the Nazis. And so what better day to visit a movie that for many people sums up the experience of those soldiers on D-Day. It's of course Saving Private Ryan, one of the greatest war movies ever made, probably, and um, I wanted to just go through the opening scene today as those rangers and the, the soldiers from the 29th Division hit the beach at Omaha Beach and, and just talk through it a little bit, uh, just to compare the reality of that landing on D-Day with what we see on the movie screen. Now, I'm not intending this to be the definitive account, the definitive review of Saving Private Ryan. It's just simply some observations that I have made uh, about this scene from my experience of, of studying uh, D-Day and speaking to veterans about the landing. So let me say at the outset, firstly, there's going to be spoilers. I'm obviously talking about this movie uh, in some detail, so there are going to be spoilers. So go out and see the movie if you haven't already watched it. I'm sure everyone has seen the movie by now. Um, also, I want to say this is a clip from YouTube that I'm going to be using, so the copyright remains with Paramount, but this is a, a clip from YouTube just for the sake of the review. Um, also, I want to say, as a historian, I absolutely love this movie. I saw it when it first came out in 1998 in the cinema as a much younger man, and I have to say I thought it was outstanding from the outset. Some of the things they didn't do as well as they could have, but overall I thought it was an absolutely astonishing war movie, one of the best ever made, and the first of a whole generation of war movies that tried to, to depict war in a realistic fashion. Up until this point, We'd seen a lot of John Wayne charging up the beaches of Iwo Jima with bullets spattering about his feet and people getting shot with no blood appearing and uh, movies didn't really depict the realities of the horror of war and this was the first one to, to really do that and I, I recall that people were absolutely shocked when they saw this. It was People were horrified by what they saw. It still is a pretty horrific opening scene but I don't think people were prepared for it and I don't think people had a, an understanding of what it meant to go to war until they saw a movie like this. I was probably the same as a young bloke. I probably didn't understand it either until I saw this movie. But I've spoken to combat veterans who say this movie does not come close to depicting what combat is actually like, but it's as close as a movie can possibly get. So I think that's some pretty high praise from people who've been there and, and had the bullets flying around them. So, you know, a great movie. Um, go and see it if you haven't already seen it. And we're going to go through and uh, talk about the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan as they land on Omaha Beach. Now, the unit that is depicted here is Charlie Company of the Second Rangers. That's the unit that they chose to depict as they land on Omaha Beach. Bit of an odd one because some of the things then don't marry up with the historical record. But as I said, this is not intended to be a criticism. This is just a comparison of what the reality of the landings on D-Day was like compared to what you're seeing on the film. So we're going to dive into it uh, and talk about it. Now, the first thing I wanted to say is before this scene, th there's one thing about the movie that from the moment I saw it, which I thought was not great was the opening and closing scenes in the cemetery set in modern times i thought i didn't think they were particularly well done i didn't see the point of them i mean they were done in a sort of a flashback form where you saw the old private ryan you know visiting the graves of his fallen comrades i've got to say the flashback is a pretty hackneyed approach to movies it's a pretty lazy way to tell a story if i may be so bold is to, to do a flashback and I, I didn't quite get the point of it i didn't think it was necessary at all I didn't think it was particularly well acted. I don't. Ass I assume that Steven Spielberg didn't direct that bit. I assume it was the some other, you know, B director that directed that for him. Um, I just didn't think it was necessary. I didn't think it was particularly well done. But the thing that really I didn't like about it is that Mr. Spielberg at this point employed a pretty cheap trick. I thought that when he finished that scene and zoomed in on the old man, he did a really tight pull shot onto the old man's eyes and then it dissolved to this scene on D-Day that we're now looking at on the screen. And moviegoers have been conditioned over the years to know that when you do a dissolve like that, a close-up of a character and then a dissolve, that it's a flashback, that the character is remembering the scene that you now see. And so that was what it looked like. It looked like that Saving Prime was... Saving Pri that Private Ryan, or the old man in the cemetery, was casting his mind back to that day when he landed on the beaches of D-Day. And... <sighs> Look, I, the reason I thought it was a cheap trick was the first character they then showed after that, we'll see it in a minute, is Tom Hanks's character. And I think they did it deliberately to trick you into thinking that Tom Hanks would survive. And spoiler alert, Tom Hanks's character does not survive. The character of the old man is actually Matt Damon, who plays Private Ryan, the, the central character of the movie. Um, I just thought it was... I, I thought it was a cheap way to try and trick you into thinking that Tom Hanks survived. There's also the issue that that dissolve into the beach scene... 
makes you think it's that old man remembering and save it. Pro- and Private Ryan was not involved in any of the uh, the landings on this beach, so he couldn't have uh, been recalling them decades later because he wasn't there to see them. So I thought that was weak and unnecessary as well. I think this movie would have been just as effective, in fact, more effective if it hadn't had those opening and closing scenes of the flag waving in the American cemetery. But let me know what you think in the comments. Lots of people disagree with that, and it certainly did present a very proud moment for America uh, with a waving flag and across the crosses. But uh, yeah, that was a, an interesting one. That's to do with movies, not history, but uh, I thought it was a, an interesting point to make. Let's get to the beach scene now. This is the opening scene now of the, the waves coming in on Omaha Beach. Um, this was not filmed in France, of course. It was filmed in England. Uh, so these scenes were filmed in Cornwall, and then the, uh, the scenes inland were filmed in Ireland. But I think they did a pretty good job of depicting Omaha Beach. So what we're looking at here are German beach defences called hedgehogs. Uh, and these were scattered across the sand, not in the numbers that, that we see here. I mean, that is an extremely crowded beach. You know, every square inch of that beach is taken up by beach obstacles. But um, uh, not as many beach obstacles uh, during D-Day, but still a good impression of what it was like. I think for the screen, they have to, um, you know, they have to, to depict it in as dramatic fashion as they can. So the idea of the hedgehogs is that at high tide, they would be below the water, and as boats came in, they would tear the hulls over of boats or capsize them. That was the point of the hedgehogs. In reality, the landing occurred just after low tide. It was a trade-off between the Army and the Navy. The Navy, the Navy wanted low tide so that the obstacles were exposed, so the boats weren't in danger of hitting them. Uh, the Army wanted high tide so that their men who landed had less ground to cross. In the end, they compromised. They went a couple of hours after low tide, which meant the beach obstacles were exposed, so the the, the boats were able to dodge them. Uh, but it did mean that there was a lot of beach for the uh, soldiers to cover when they came out of those boats, and that was responsible for a lot of the heavy casualties. So a trade-off. Uh, who knows whether it was the right decision, but this is uh, this is why we see these beach ob- obstacles exposed. So let's move a little bit forward. Use the water coming in to pick that low tide. Okay, this is an interesting one here on the left here. This, the other type of beach obstacle, this one, the sort of the ramps, the wooden ramps. Uh, this one is correct, this one here. This one is just plain wrong, and the majority of them, we can see some more in the background, uh, depicted incorrectly. The, the idea, the, this one here it demonstrates how they were supposed to be used. It was a ramp, a timber ramp, so a log on these stilts with an explosive mine at the end. So the theory was that at high tide, a boat would hit this ramp, wouldn't see it in the, in the high water, would launch up this this ramp capsize and hit the mine and explode. So that was the point of the obstacle. So these ones are completely backwards. They faced inland so that boats coming in would hit them and launch up that ramp. So that's just a, an out and out mistake that the movie makers made. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure why they made these mistakes because it's they were fairly obvious. The anyone who's seen any photos would know how this is set up. So I I suspect no offense to anyone involved in the movie, but I suspect the people that they got to be advisors on the the D Day landing knew a lot about D Day, but but but. Didn't quite do some things as well as they could have. Interesting that um, Steven Spielberg seemed to repair that in future productions that he did, like Band of Brothers was a lot more historically accurate. But that's an interesting one. That's a, that's an out-and-out mistake right there, showing the uh, there's those beach obstacles pointing in the wrong direction. Let's carry on. So again, you can see the level of the tide there coming in, June 6, 1944, D-Day. Okay, the Dog Green sector of Omaha Beach. Uh, was a prominent sector and was one of the sectors where most of the casualties occurred on Omaha Beach during D-Day. So there were five landing beaches for uh, the D-Day operation. So Omaha and Utah for the Americans, Gold and Sword for the British, and then Juno for the Canadians. The Canadians are effectively operating as a unit of the British um, of the British Army, so the British and Canadians can be combined here together. Um, again, just a, an interesting. The reality compared to what we see in the movie is the the unit depicted the uh, Charlie Company of the Second Rangers. They did land on Omaha Beach uh, on the morning of D-Day, but not in this sector. They landed a bit further to the west in Charlie Sector, and their job was to climb cliffs and take out a defensive position and open up a draw. So uh, from the outset, the unit depicted in this scene uh, is landing in the wrong sector. I'm not sure why they were so focused on the Second Rangers. Maybe that was just a sexier unit than maybe they thought the standard infantry was a little bit boring. Um, but I don't think it would have lost anything had the unit that was depicted in Saving Private Ryan simply been an infantry unit from the 29th Division, and then this would have been more accurate from the from the outset. Now, the other thing I want to say about that too is uh, the units that they that eventually they have to go and find, the airborne units that they have to go and find, landed behind a completely different beach, Utah Beach. So it wouldn't have made sense that they sent the Rangers from Omaha all the way to Utah. 
Again, what that says is I'm not sure why they chose the second Rangers because it created a whole heap of inaccuracies, but there we go. It's a movie. They've got to take some poetic license. Okay, landing craft coming in. Um, I think they've done pretty well with these landing craft. Um, they, these are supposed to be US Higgins boats. They're, um, you know, they've been designed to look like Higgins boats. The numbers are quite accurate for for boats that have been launched off a US ship. The the idea that the landing craft would come in like this and the ramp would go down, um, that is absolutely what happened on D-Day. Again, the only bit where it varies, you can see with this guy here, you can see this diamond on the back of his helmet. Again, the unit they are depicting are the Second Rangers, uh, and the Second Rangers launched from British ships and came ashore in uh, in British um, LVAs, uh, which were, um, sorry, LCAs, which were British landing craft, not the American LCVPs, which are depicted here, the Higgins boats. So, again, poetic license, but not quite accurate. The, the naval units that brought the Second Rangers ashore we're British. Okay, on here. This looks pretty good. I mean, rough seas, racing in. And this is the first time we see Tom Hanks. I like what they did with the gear. I think they got the gear really right, the the type of um, gear that they were carrying and uh, everything about the look and feel of it seems pretty spot on. So here's Tom Hanks. I want to talk a little bit about Tom Hanks' character in this. Um, so... Tom Hanks is a captain in the Second Rangers. That's the setup. Um, a couple of things I didn't, I never quite followed about this is, firstly, he's way too old. Tom Hanks was, um, you know, in his early forties when this movie was made. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the ages of the characters shortly. Um, Tom Hanks is obviously a combat veteran. He talks a number of times about other units, other men that he's lost during combat. This is not his first mission. It's not his first battle. Um, they don't reveal what units he served in previously because. Uh, the Second Rangers were formed in 1943 specifically to take part in Operation Overlord, which is the landing on D-Day. So they, they never quite explain his background, but I assume he's served in other units before now. He makes reference. His sergeant, Sergeant Horvath, has the later on the sand that he takes from the beach, and he's also got containers that show uh, Italy uh, and also Africa. So he's obviously fought in the earliest campaigns, the earliest European and African campaigns that the Americans participated in, but that must have been with a different unit. That can't have been with the Second Rangers. Um, so it's interesting. Also interesting, Tom Hanks is depicted as a captain, Captain Miller. Um, yeah, I, I always thought that, I thought that was interesting as well. Obviously, they needed someone who was high-ranking enough to, uh, you know, to get the job done. Um, but throughout this, uh, he acts more like a squad leader to me. Uh, you know, the, 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 the real captain of, um, of Charlie Company, the Second Rangers, was 24 rather than in his early 40s. And he commanded about 60 or 70 men in that company. Um, and he was in charge of, you know, that big unit of men. Tom Hanks throughout this acts more like a squad leader to me, um, you know, like a perhaps a low-ranked uh, lieutenant would act, leading that, that number of men, you know, reporting directly to the sergeant and working very closely with the sergeant. Um, they don't really mention other officers here. It's really only Tom Hanks leading these men. Um, but there is a scene later on where there is a lieutenant who I can assume was Tom Hanks, you know, company lieutenant. Uh, one of several lieutenants he would have had in that company. But yeah, I thought that was a bit odd that the uh, captain was involved in uh, such a small-scale operation. I suppose it could have happened, given casualties, but it seemed a little bit odd to me. I thought uh, the, the company commander would have had you know, a bigger job than simply leading this small group of men. But there you go. You know, They had to pick a good character, and they, they went with this one of the company. Uh, commander Tom Hanks is a captain. Okay, this is something here. If we look here on his helmet, this has been debated ad nauseum since this movie came out. There were actually, I, I, while looking this up, I saw letters from veterans that they'd written when this movie came out in 1998 saying, I landed on D-Day and no captain in his right mind would have had his rank painted on the front of his helmet like that. It just would have made him a target for snipers. Uh, that is absolutely true. And I think if I was a captain landing on D-Day, I'd be pretty nervous about having a bright captain's bars displayed on my helmet like that. Um, however, it did happen. There are a number of accounts of some units where they did force their captains to paint and their other officers to paint their rank on the front of their helmet, or they would stick their, they would stick a, an emblem on the front or, or something like that. So it did absolutely happen on D-Day. I saw one account from a, a, a lieutenant who said that uh, you know it, he was a target for snipers throughout D-Day because of the uh, the logo on the front of his helmet. I would have to say it also didn't happen quite a lot as well. You know these guys were. Um, 
you know, very aware that they were going to be shot at and they were going to be singled out as if they were marked as officers. Uh, so often it, it, it didn't occur either. But it, it's so it's not a mistake. Some people have said this is a mistake. It absolutely isn't. I, I, I don't know whether the second rangers encouraged their officers to paint their rank on their helmets, but it certainly did occur on D-Day. And again, it's a movie we need Tom Hanks to stand out as an officer and a leader of men. Interestingly, on the backs of helmets was where rank was often indicated. So a horizontal line for an NCO, so a corporal or a sergeant, uh, and then a vertical line for an officer, and sometimes two vertical lines if it was a captain to distinguish them from a, from a lieutenant, um, and I or a lieutenant, as the Americans say. And I think uh, watching this, that Tom Hanks actually does have that painted on the back of his helmet as well. So, yeah, so interesting. They, they mostly got it right. Uh, a pretty good nod to, uh, to what actually happened on D-Day. So they're heading in now on the boats. These black uh, bags on their front are for a gas mask, uh, which, again, is very, uh, very accurate. The soldiers did wear gas masks. They weren't sure what they would face when they hit the beaches. Uh, they pretty quickly abandoned them, though, because they realized that gas was not going to be used uh, by the Germans, which is no doubt a good thing soldiers getting sick here again very very accurate a couple of things going on now uh, the reason soldiers were getting sick is because um you know firstly nerves and that's probably how it's depicted here is they're very nervous coming ashore um the the other thing was though the seas were extremely rough d-day was actually intended for the 5th of june and the, the weather was so terrible that they postponed it for one day uh but the seas were huge the the soldiers basically got seasick and this rough ride in if you can imagine being below the, you know, below the level of the of the craft, they couldn't see where they were going. They were heading into their first combat mission. For most of them, pretty scary stuff. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, a lot of them did get seasick. That's a pretty common report. Um, I'm going to talk about this guy. Let's hit play here. Okay, that guy. Uh, I'm going to talk about this because it's been mentioned a lot, but I should mention it as well. Is that that guy, the 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 navy man in that boat? Um, he should not be American. Let's have a look at him again. Okay, he should not be an American. The As we said, the second rangers came ashore in British craft, having launched from British ships, and so this guy uh, should not have been an, an American. Um, again, I don't mind this. You know, they, they, They're telling an American story, but the one thing I will say is that this movie cops some criticism for its depiction of the, uh, you know, the UK troops, the British troops that landed on D-Day. So I'm going to highlight this now. I don't really care about it in this scene. It doesn't matter that much, but I'm going to highlight it as one of the issues with the movie I thought was the depiction of the UK troops. And this, I'm not the first person to say this. It's been mentioned quite a lot. So um, the reality of the D-Day landing was that the US landed about 57,000 troops on D-Day and the British and Canadians landed 75,000 troops on their three beaches. So, you know, there was a much bigger British effort than the American effort, not to take anything away from the Americans, but what we should always say, like so many things in the Second World War, is it was a combined effort. Uh, no side acted in isolation. They all needed each other. So, yeah, some of the later depictions of the Brits, you know, Monty's taking his time sort of depictions of the British, I thought were a little unfair. So we can highlight that at this moment, that this, in, in reality on D-Day, this would have been a, a British sol- sailor, not an American. Uh, having said that, he is an American, and they've done something quite accurate. He has a grey band painted around his helmet, which the Navy men did use on D-Day to distinguish them from the Army soldiers. <laughs> Okay, so back to, again, these boats coming in. I think this is very accurate, again, the way this would have been. Officers and sergeants giving their men advice. Uh, we can see in the backs of the helmets there, the second range is painted. We can also see here, I'm a bit of a helmet nerd, so, you know, we've got bare helmets here, and we've also got the distinctive netting, uh, which was quite common. Um, something that's been mentioned quite a lot, did soldiers tie up, did they use the chin strap? There's a chin strap here on the back of the helmet, which is supposed to, as I said, go around the chin. This one here is from the liner, the, the, this part of the helmet, the American helmet comes in two parts. There's a liner that goes on the head, then the hard helmet goes over the top. This is the chin strap for the liner, and it was almost universally worn like that to keep the liner attached to the main part of the helmet. Uh, but at the back here, at the backs of these helmets, these guys have their chin strap for the hard shell of the helmet, which is supposed to go under the chin. They've got it tied around the back. Um, again, controversial. People say, wouldn't the soldiers have kept those done up under their chins? And I've spoken to World War II veterans who say we always wore our our chin straps done up because we didn't want our helmets falling off um but it looks much cooler i've got to say for the movie to have the chin strap at the back of the helmet rather than under the chin it does look a little bit dorky to have the chin strap done up under your chin and if you look at photos of d-day so many of the soldiers had their chin straps at the back of their helmet like this it's so it's it's split evenly you can see photos of soldiers wearing their chin straps you can see photos of soldiers with them pinned up 
behind their helmet. And often you'll see soldiers running um, with their hand on their head. Uh, this is not to uh, you know protect them from incoming fire. This is so that the helmet didn't fall off. Because if you've tried on one of these uh, US helmets from the Second World War, they're heavy. They don't sit on your head very well. And if you try to run with that thing on, it's going to fall off pretty quickly. So when we see in this movie and in other footage, soldiers with their head on their helmet, that's to stop the helmet from falling off because they weren't wearing their chin strap. So that's just an interesting one. Again, some people have said that's a, uh, that's a mistake for Hollywood, that they would have had their chin straps done up. Uh, but the photos I've seen of D-Day indicate that many men wore them just like depicted here. Get the sand out of your weapons. Keep Again, Tom Hanks clear. giving orders. Keep sand out of your weapons. Good advice. Troops coming in. Now the first fire starts. It would have been absolutely terrifying. Uh, this is interesting here. This soldier is holding here what appears to be a Bangalore torpedo. Um, which was used for clearing beach defences. And obviously they wanted to show that early in the movie because they, in this movie they come into effect later on. Uh, they use them quite effectively to clear the barbed wire, so that's why they wanted to show them early. Soldiers coming in again. It been pretty nerve-wracking as those first machine gun bullets and shells started to explode as they came in. Okay, I want to talk about this gentleman here. Uh, no disrespect to this actor, but this is obviously an older bloke, maybe in his late 30s or even his early 40s. Um, let's talk a little bit about the reality of D-Day. Um, one of the things that I thought was unusual about this movie was that uh, the soldiers depicted in it were quite a bit older than the soldiers of the Second World War. Um, the average age of a soldier in the US forces at D-Day was in his early 20s. 22 or 23 was probably an average age. An officer would have been slightly older, but again, probably only 24 or 25. Uh, so the the actors chosen to depict this uh, this famous chapter of history are way too old for the for the reality. Um, and I, I looked this up uh, just before I, I started filming this. And let's go through the ages of some of those actors. This is in 1997 when this was filmed. So what age were these actors in that year? What age did they turn during that year? So let's go through them. So these are the actors that featured um, in the famous scene, the squad that went to find Private Ryan. So uh, Giovanni Ribisi. Uh, was 23, so he was the youngest. Barry Pepper, uh, Adam Goldberg, and Matt Damon were 27. Jeremy Davies, who played Upham, was 28. Edward Burns was 29. Vin Diesel, in one of the first roles we saw him in, was 30. Tom Sizemore, Sergeant Horvath, was 36. Tom Hanks turned 41 during the filming, and of course we see Ted Danson later on as a captain. Uh, and Ted Danson was the granddaddy of a lot of them at age 50. Um, this is way too old for the men that landed on D-Day. Again, not a criticism of the film, but just an unusual choice. They chose actors who were so old. These men are substantially older than the men who would have participated on D-Day. As I said, the the real captain who was the uh, commander of Charlie Company of the 2nd Rangers was 24. Um, the average age of the troops would have been probably about 22, 21 or 22. Uh, and a statistic I saw which really spells this out is that by D-Day when the draft was in full force in America, so conscription, 50% uh, of all the soldiers being drafted into the army at that time were aged 18 because as soon as men turned 18, they were drafted into the army. So 50% of new recruits at the time of D-Day were aged 18. So that just shows how young these men were. So interesting, again, a depiction that the soldiers here were a little bit on the old side to, uh, compared to the reality. Here we are coming in. Again, I've spoken to veterans about this and they could hear the bullets smacking off the outside of the craft as they came in, just terrifying. Soldiers landing. Surely the most terrifying scene as these soldiers come in. Just really horrific. This, song, this scene absolutely shocked me when I saw it. The door comes down and the machine guns laying into them. Now, there was some extremely heavy fire on Omaha Beach. Not quite this heavy, I would say. Uh, this is, a, again, a slight exaggeration, but it was extremely heavy. Okay, we've got machine gunners firing here. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, mach the machine gun defenders on Omaha Beach. So, uh, Omaha Beach was very strongly defended. The German Atlantic Wall stretched all the way along the coast of France and was designed to prevent just such a, just such a landing. Um, the beaches of Normandy were well defended uh, by uh, by troops uh, who were, you know, quite quite uh, quite expert at using their weapons. Um, but a couple of things here that don't quite ring true: these machine guns are supposed to depict MG42, the fearsome German machine gun. Um, most of the machine guns were set up to fire along the beach. Without going into too much detail, the most effective fire against troops is enfilade fire, which means fire coming in from the side, um, not fire head on against the troops so while there were machine gun positions that were set up like this to fire directly out to sea the vast majority of the machine guns that caused all the damage on d-day were sweeping along the beach uh, the full length of the beach the beaches where particularly omaha beach were long and straight 
uh, and enable the Germans to set up machine guns and artillery pieces to fire directly along the beach. So the German machine gunners had a very long field of fire, several miles, in fact, all the way up the coast, uh, and lots of targets to shoot at. So this depiction, again, works well for the small or for the screen where things where spacing has to be compressed. Uh, but the German bunkers were, were typically hidden in the bluffs and were firing at the side. So when we see these photos of the Americans coming ashore, taken from the landing craft, looking at the shore, you can't actually see German defensive positions. Uh, you can see machine gun bullets splashing into the water, as we see here. This was quite uh, in, the, in the motion pictures we've seen of D-Day landings. You can see machine gun bullets splashing into the water, um, but most of that fire was coming from the side. The German bunkers that we see depicted here are a bit larger and more substantial than the ones that were actually there on D-Day. Um, but again, it's to, uh, for, that, for that dramatic effect. Also, the beach is extremely narrow here. Uh, it was much wider uh, on D-Day. Um, it, was, it was about 400 yards wide, in fact, at low tide. So the, the distances were much greater on D-Day. The machine gunners would be shooting along the beach, not directly at the landing craft. And consequently, the idea that men were being hit in such you know, disastrous numbers from fire coming directly from in front is probably not accurate, but does work very well to give that depiction for a Hollywood movie. So again, it's not a criticism. It's just a, a comparison with the reality. Um, so let's carry on some horrific scenes also I should say about the machine gunners here they were not firing in the way that German machine gunners were trained to fire during the second world war the way machine gunners have fired ever since the machine gun was invented is in short bursts so firing three or four shots at a time aiming and firing carefully a couple of reasons for that firstly machine guns have a lot of recoil even ones you know even blowback operator ones like the mg42 uh, they produce a lot of recoil as you fire them they wanted to lurch backwards and so if you wanted to keep aiming accurately you had to fire in short bursts the machine gunners did not fire in long bursts like this so you couldn't aim very effectively if you fired in long bursts you chewed through your ammunition way too fast you were in risk of jamming the gun they were fed from a belt which contained ammunition and the the rate of fire of the mg42 was was very very fast indeed about 1200 rounds a minute and so if you fired in long bursts, you would burn through your ammunition very quickly. But most importantly, you would also burn through your barrel. The barrel would heat up very quickly. These machine guns were air-cooled. And if you fired in those long bursts, you would very quickly overheat your barrel. The gun would, uh, would not aim accurately from that point onwards and would not fire effectively from that point onwards. So machine gunners were, learnt to fire, were trained to fire in short bursts. So these long bursts we see depicted here... Um, were unlikely to, to occur and uh, that's what veterans reported as well the Americans that hit the beach reported hearing the short sharp tearing sound of the machine guns as they fired at them so again a couple of machine guns in a bunker that bunker is again way too large for the ones that were actually on D-Day but it depicts quite well the bluffs and the high ground they had to they had to climb to get ashore Again, some awful scenes here of the men going to deep water. This absolutely happened. A lot of men went over the side. Either the either their landing craft hit obstacles or uh, or just came in too far out or the fire was too heavy, so they went over the side into quite deep water. The water was 10 feet or more deep, and they were very encumbered with gear. So this depiction of men being dragged down by their gear is very accurate. It was a horrific end for many veterans who drowned in the water because of the weight of their gear just awful again these were the scenes that i think when all of us saw this the first time we're just horrified this one here it's been said a few times but we'll uh, we'll recount it again here is that um this is this is pure hollywood the idea of men being hit in the water anyone who's seen mythbusters will see they've they've done several episodes on firing bullets into water and water effectively uh, completely uh destroys the kinetic energy of bullets and bullets tend to break up when they hit the water uh, and so the water in reality, any soldiers that were in the water on D-Day, the water was protecting them uh, rather, than, uh, uh, the, rather than creating problems for them like we see here. But again, good Hollywood. Always these things are a balance between historical accuracy and making a good movie. And I think they did that pretty well in Saving Private Ryan. That poor bugger drowning under the weight of his gear. What a terrible way to go. Okay, so this is uh, quite interesting here. This, shows, uh, this is Tom Hanks's character here on the left. A good depiction again we've got beach obstacles with waves breaking over them that's fairly accurate for the height of the tide we've got these high bluffs it wasn't quite as horrific as this with smoke streaming off the top and these huge bunkers but it's a good depiction again of the high bluffs that overhooked overlooked omaha beach uh the uh, orange diamond with the number two depicting the second rangers um and tom hanks here with a vertical stripe indicating that he is an officer that uh, is quite accurate so they've done that quite well again just the struggle to get ashore the Germans had these beaches completely pre-sided. They'd had a very long time to prepare, months and months they had to prepare. And uh, they set up these defences very, very well. A uh, good depiction here of the beach obstacles rather than hindering the landing actually provided the only cover on the beach. 
Okay, bullets splashing into the water. This is an interesting one here. This soldier is holding what appears to be a plastic bag over his Garand rifle, and uh, it's been said before again. I've seen the criticism that uh, that plastic wasn't invented till the 50s, so why are they using this? I think for this movie, they did just use plastic bags, but what they're depicting is a substance called pliofilm, which was a rubberized, almost like plastic, but it was a rubberized film that was could be used to 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 protect. Uh, to waterproof uh, machinery and various things, and they were used on D-Day. The famous photo of the landing craft with the soldiers having just left the landing craft, there is a pliofilm bag right in the foreground. Uh, I think for, for the sake of expediency, they just used plastic bags for this movie. Um, but again, it's not uh, it's not a mistake to say that their weapons were protected with, um, with some sort of soft bag made out of pliofilm uh, and of course it was to keep salt water and dirt out of the actions of the bags it's 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 the preparation that went into the d-day landings was quite extraordinary it took them two years to plan the landings and i think it always amazes me about d-day is the minute details they went into they knew the men would be coming ashore in water and there was a risk of sand clogging their weapons so they gave them these bags to protect the actions clever stuff like always in combat, soldiers want to hit the ground whenever they come under fire. Terrible idea on the beach. The beach is all pre-sided, as like Tom Hanks says. And again, we can see those beach obstacles facing the wrong way as they come in. It's, it's pretty accurate. Soldiers sheltering behind the beach obstacles. This man has a squib in his pocket. You can see it, uh, which then goes off to simulate a, a war wound to simulate where the bullet hit him. Yeah, the movie landing in the water. It was interesting the camera work, wasn't it? This was the first time they they used this technique of sort of the uh, the, the sort of the, the newsreel footage where they drained the colour away from the footage and shot it in a frame rate to make it look like old time footage. Again, these machine gunners are firing way too fast as well as their officer like the time to slow the hell down. Um, but again, we get the point tracer bullets as well to show how quickly the bullets are coming in and where they're going. Again, the carnage wasn't quite as severe as this, but it's a movie we've got to show exactly how horrific it was. Uh, artillery blast, again, that was a part of D-Day, and the Germans had um, artillery pieces at each end of the beach uh, and were firing in enfilade. So again, the, those artillery guns can shoot for miles. Uh, so they had uh, lots of targets to shoot at. Uh, so lots of craft were blown up. Um, lots of men were hit on the beach by, by artillery shells. Um, looking here again, we can see these beach obstacles depicted quite well with the mine at the end, uh, but they're facing the wrong way. Uh, some soldiers are starting to shoot back. We just saw some fire there from uh, from someone with the Thompson submachine gun. This soldier's firing his Garand. It would have been pretty ineffective against those bunkers, but soldiers you know, feel like they have to do something in this situation. So it makes sense that they'd be that they'd be shooting back as ineffective as There are reports of the water turning red with blood, um, so that is accurate. That the this the number of men hit in the water uh, turned the water red with blood. Um, that scene where the uh, let's actually see that again because it's quite well done. The soldier being blown into the air, losing a leg. Um, again, just part and parcel of what happens in war when artillery goes off. Limbs are you know flung from bodies. It's really quite horrific, but a, a good, accurate portrayal of exactly what happened there. Um, the way they shot this, interestingly, was they had um, amputees who would uh, were on a, a harness system. The harness would hoik them into the air when there was an explosion beneath them and then drop them back onto the beach. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was how they shot that. So clever filmmaking once again. Horrific scene. This was the first time we saw this sort of shell shock imagery used. This was, uh, you know, one of the first times this was used when it goes to slow mo. Tom Hanks looking around, Captain Miller looking around, just seeing the, the horror unfolding all around him. The first time this was used, um, but it used to really good effect. We've seen it since in a lot of movies and in video games as well to depict just that horror of combat. So I think that's fairly realistic. Yeah, you would not have wanted to be a, a flamethrower guy coming ashore under that fire. It would make you quite a big target. I don't know if a flamethrower would explode quite to that level. You know, one of the most um, horrific parts of the story, the man looking for his lost arm on the beach. There, that, that's a direct account of a, of a veteran did see that. Um, and it's it's a natural reaction. You've just lost a vital part of your body, so you want to you know pick it up. For what purpose, I don't know, but it just makes sense. Um, this soldier we can see from his shoulder title here, 
uh, he's from the 29th division. So it, it, in this narrative, in the, in the story of Saving Private Ryan, somehow the Rangers have become mixed up with units from the 29th Infantry as they uh, came ashore from the 29th Division. They've all become mixed up and landed on the same spot on Omaha Beach. Um, didn't actually happen that way. The 29th landed in Dog Green and uh, Charlie Company of the 2nd Rangers landed in Charlie Sector. Um, but in this telling of the story, they've become mixed up and landed on the same patch of beach. landing craft being hit um, again part of the story a lot of landing craft were hit by the artillery fire coming down the beach and were destroyed before they even got ashore I think this was a good and well done scene just showing the horror you know putting your helmet back on trying to get back into it Tom Hanks in spite of the horror around him trying to be a good soldier and get on with the job so again snapping him back to reality these soldiers from the 29th Division again. These are not part of the same unit as Captain Miller. And now, of course, get off the beach. This is where it seemed that Captain Miller became um, a bit more of a squad leader. Uh, there didn't seem to be much... Uh, he seemed to be working very, very tightly with his sergeant. Good advice from the sergeant. As we know, sergeants run the army. So, get off the beach. There's always advice that soldiers follow during the amphibious landing. The enemy has had a long time to get this beach pre-sighted, so getting off the beach is the only way to survive. It's counterintuitive. Soldiers want to hit the dirt when they come under fire, but the only way to survive is to get off the beach. Okay, again, soldiers from both the 2nd Rangers and the 29th Division mixed up together. There was plenty of that on D-Day. The units getting confused and mixed up together. It didn't quite happen like this in this sector of the beach, but that's okay. This does depict what was going on. There are a lot of Rangers there. Most of the men we see seem to be Rangers. It's way too crowded. It, 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 you know, it wasn't as bad as this. Uh, it, so. it's sadly, soldiers crying out for their mum is a pretty uh, common report. Really well done, these scenes. You know, you can be chatting to someone and next minute they, they get hit. See why these scenes were so uh, why people were so shocked when they saw these scenes to, to actually see what a war could be like. Okay, this was a scene I was talking about before. This guy's a left a lieutenant, as Americans say, and Tom Hanks recognises him and runs over to help him. Um, it wasn't made pretty. It wasn't made obvious, but he's got a lieutenant mark on his helmet, and he's obviously someone that Tom Hanks knows. Um, I think this is the sort of guy that you would have seen leading the squad rather than the captain. Uh, so there is a lieutenant there. They're just not particularly. Um, well shown in the movie. Okay, this guy was interesting, I thought. He's got a USN-7 on his helmet, uh, so he is from the um, 7th Naval Beach Battalion, uh, and these were basically the liaisons. They landed with the troops, and their job was to liaise between the uh, the Army troops and the Navy troops. Um, they had various jobs to do. One of their minor jobs, certainly wasn't the major job, was to clear beach obstacles uh, when they came ashore. So that's the job that this man is doing. He's a demolition man clearing obstacles. This was a bit of a funny exchange, I thought, between... Tom Hanks and the, and the Navy man because um, Tom Hanks... I, I think this scene was intended to show that some men followed orders even when they were ridiculous and, and silly, it was silly to follow them given what was going on all around them. Uh, this is the scene where the, the Navy man says that his job is to clear these beach obstacles so he's telling Tom Hanks to get out of the way. He's got to clear the beach obstacles so the tanks can land. Tom Hanks is saying all the tanks are at the bottom of the channel so there's no point clearing the beach obstacles the, and the Navy man responds, well, orders, sir... I'm going to clear these beach obstacles. I thought that was an odd depiction of what was going on because we should remember that, that that waves and waves of troops came in. This may be the first wave landing, but several waves followed for most of the day after them. And clearing beach obstacles was absolutely essential work that, that did have to be done. It didn't matter that the first wave of tanks didn't get ashore. Firstly, lots of tanks did get ashore, but secondly, it didn't matter that some of them had sunk because what these infantry desperately need is tank support. They're under machine gun and artillery fire, they have no way of answering back except for small arms. The one thing they do desperately need is is, is tank support, uh, and their commanding officers would notice that pretty quickly and direct tanks to come ashore at every spot they possibly could. So clearing of beach obstacles so that the tanks did not explode, you know, mines, obstacles that would stop the tanks, the clearing of those obstacles was essential work. So this man continuing with those orders to me is extremely sensible, and he's doing his job very, very well. 
So an odd depiction of uh, of his orders to clear the beach. Make hold, make hold Interestingly, we see this guy again later on. Not only does he appear here, but we also see him in later scenes during the landing. Uh, several times, in fact. He pops up uh, in several places. Again, Tom Hanks dragging his lieutenant. I thought it was interesting in this scene too, the lieutenant said he was hit low um, and I thought that was interesting, probably unintentional but it did uh, it did demonstrate again that many of the machine guns that were firing the enfilade along the beach were set up to fire uh, at a very low level, only a foot or two above the ground and that's pretty standard when setting up defensive positions because you don't want to waste bullets flying over the heads of your enemy. It's pretty awful to talk about but if... Um, you know, if you're shooting low, you might hit them in the legs or the lower part of the body. That's still going to incapacitate them. If you're shooting over their heads, uh, you, you've got a risk of missing them. So machine guns are usually set up to fire pretty low. Uh, and also soldiers, when they come into fire, hit the ground. So, you know, so war occurs at low levels close to the ground. It, uh, so it's, uh, as I said, it was probably unintentional, but the, the lieutenant saying he was hit low was, um, was quite accurate as, as the, uh, you know, as, as the landings uh, unfolded on Omaha Beach. Um, there's something interesting here, the, the, a, a good depiction. They, they've done well with the, the minor bits of kit here. This soldier on the right is holding this long pole, looks like a long broom handle or something. Uh, that's actually a pole charge, which weren't used. It was a good idea, but they weren't They didn't weren't used particularly effectively on D-Day. But this is basically a, a, a long pole. I think it's maybe 10 or 12 feet long um, with a big explosive charge on the end of it. And they were used or intended to be used for clearing bunkers exactly for this purpose. So the idea was... Uh, you would get up. I mean, you needed obviously nerves of steel to do this, but you would get up beside the uh, the embrasure in the in the bunker, and you would light the fuse and then shove that thing in there and then hold it in place um, while the you know while the charge went off inside to clear the bunker. I can only imagine the horror of being in that bunker when that pole came in with an explosive charge on the end of it. But I've heard about those being used in other battles as well. They weren't particularly effective on D-Day, but I've heard about them being used in other battles, particularly in the Pacific. Uh, pole charges were quite often used with the less formal structures that the Japanese were using. The Japanese bunkers tended to be made of coconut logs and dug into the ground. Pole charges were particularly effective against those Japanese bunkers. Again, uh, really quite horrific. And I spoke to a uh, I spoke to a Marine veteran from the Pacific once, and he talked about the job of the demolition men, the blokes that would run forward either with pole charges or satchel charges to clear bunkers. And uh, he said the uh, the required skills to be a, a demolition man during the Second World War, you needed to be quick, you needed to be fast, and you needed to have no significant plans for the future. It was they were pretty brave men doing some pretty tough work. So interesting that they depicted the pole charge here. You can see the explosive charge on the end of there as they Again, charging forward under fire. This is exactly what happened. The men had no choice but to charge forward and get under the bank. Now uh, they're showing a the flamethrower man again there because they wanted to be able to come into effect later on. Um, these bunkers again, massive, really terrifying. They, they weren't quite that big, but um, there were certainly plenty of bunkers around for Americans had to attack later in the campaign for that sort of side. Very accurate again. The Americans rushed forward and shelled under the bank. That was the only thing they could do with the, uh, the Germans to shoot down um, from those high positions. Uh, and again, the final scene as the Americans charge in and shelter under that bank. Um, which is where we're going to leave it. So uh, that's the beach landing scene. I'm going to do another one of these videos where I depict later scenes in Saving Private Ryan, but it's a great scene in spite of my um, suggestions that it varied in some parts from the reality. I think as a depiction of not just combat, but the D-Day landings, it's, it stands unrivaled in terms of its visceral effect and it's uh, the understanding it gives you of what it's like to be in combat. What did you think? Give me, um, give me your comments. Post your comments about uh, about that opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. What did you think when you saw it? Uh, anything else you noted that differed from the reality of the landings? What do you think they did well in this? What do you think they didn't do so well? A great scene, one of the great scenes in movie making and uh, just a, a quite an achievement. So thanks very much. Don't forget to subscribe if you have enjoyed this video and I look forward to talking to you again soon.